Hey, good morning and welcome to BNC. Whether you're here in the room or you're watching online, we're so glad you've chosen to worship with us. Will you stand to your feet as we sing together? You may be seated. We are so glad you're here today to worship with us and celebrate, and we get to spend some time together. If you were with us online, we welcome you and really do invite you to jump into the chat with Pastor Aaron and his team of volunteers and just make sure that you let them know that you are there. We do have a few announcements for you. We wanna make you aware. It, online, there's a link that you can follow to the handouts, but if you walked in the room today, we did have a bulletin 
make sure you grab one either when you were coming in or as you'll be leaving a little later today. But uh, we do have a few things. First one is if you're a guest or visitor with us today, there's a QR code that is on the screens. It was on the screens when you came in. It's also on the handout. That just do us a favor, use the camera on your phone and fill that out. Do the information with it. There's a link you can follow online as well. And give us the opportunity to get to know you. If you are in the room and in person today, please stop by Guest Central at the end of the service. We do have a gift for you. And just, again, just be able to put a name with a face and, and just spend a few moments together. So we invite you to do that. Also, this Thursday, September 29th, is LeaderCast, 8.30 in the morning. There is still room and capacity for you to sign up and be a part of this. If you have any coworkers, maybe somebody in your neighborhood, uh, it's a continuing education opportunity. It's a leadership development opportunity. Uh, the LeaderCast uh, presentation that they'll be doing, there's multiple speakers. It's a great lineup, and we invite you to be a part of this. We, we love uh, LeaderCast. I've been doing this the last few years, and would love for you to participate with us as well. Also, next Sunday, October the 2nd, uh, it is an estate planning uh, luncheon after uh, the second service. And so we would love to have you join us. Dr. Mark Lell will be with us. He was from the Nazarene Foundation. And really what this is, we know that it's not exciting to think about when you die. Nobody wants to have that conversation. Nobody's lining up to die, right? We get it. But it is something that could help. Maybe there's some tax advantages for you. Also, some ways to maybe help loved ones that will be taking um, your legacy forward and just what your wishes are. And so we invite you. Maybe you've got it all figured out. You've already met with the appropriate people in your life to have the, the discussion, or you haven't thought about it yet. It is a free lunch, but we do need you to sign up so we are prepared, and we want you to do that. You can do that again through the QR code. So it would be the luncheon next Sunday after the second service. You can be a part of that and be an opportunity to just make some plans for the future. Also, we do have baptism coming up, and that is one of our favorite Sundays of the year when we get to do uh, baptism, be a part of this. And so baptism is actually going to be in November, November 6th, but on October the 9th, in, after each service, the 9 a.m. and 1045, there's a baptism class. <clears throat> Excuse me. And really what that is about is understanding what is baptism, should I be baptized, and, and all of those things. It answers those questions. If you are thinking about it, if you have a child that is thinking about it, then we highly encourage you and, and want you to be a part of this class. You can sign up, again, by the QR code or step about to the Information Center as well, and you can do this. So we're going to get right back into worship. I'm going to ask you to stand with me, and I do want to make just one quick announcement about the message today. I don't know if you, have you ever been hurt by somebody in your family? Right, I'm sure nobody, there you go. Nobody's been hurt, right? So we are going to talk about some difficult things today, and more than likely, it is an adult-themed service. And we are making you aware that if you have children with you in the room, you may, this may be an opportunity to just go, you know what, we've never tried out the children's ministry, today's your day. If not, you may be having a really awkward conversation at lunch. Doesn't bother me none, but it may you. So as we get ready to greet one another, you may want to slot out, put them in children's ministry, come back, and we'll be ready to roll. Sound good? Father God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the opportunity we have to gather and to be in your space and place together. And Father, we thank you. We thank you. And Father, I just pray that as this time, the words that are spoken, the words that are sung, and the instruments that are played will be holy and pleasing to you and will honor you with this time. And we ask all these things, your most precious and holy name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Now do me a huge favor, introduce yourself to those around you. Lift your voice, sing, I love you, Lord. I 
We declare It is well. 
one voice we sing through it all. fixed on you and we are so thankful that you're God we can trust we are so thankful that you are good we know from scripture that good goodness is in the root of who you are that there is no good apart from you so God when those when those words are hard to sing when it doesn't feel like everything is okay feels like the world around us is crumbling, but will you help us to have eyes that are fixed only on you, on a God who loves us and cares for us, on a God who grieves with us, who holds us tight when it feels like the rest of the world has let us down, who celebrates with us and is our biggest cheerleader when everything is going right. We don't want to do anything apart from you. We don't want to do anything apart from you. So God, we, we know that you're here, but we want our hearts and our minds to be so open and aware of what you're doing in this space. We are so grateful for the promise of who you are and that you meet us right where we're at. God, this morning on our hearts is also a team from Northwest Indiana and several people from our very own tribe that are headed to Kentucky to help with flood relief efforts. God, we're so grateful for the opportunity to assist in your work because we know that your heart breaks. Your heart breaks when people are hurting. Your heart breaks when life isn't fair. Your heart breaks in the midst of disaster and so our hope and our prayer hope in our prayer is that we can go and be reflections of who you are to those people. God, will you be with our team and just give them safe travel as they head down? God, will you give them a peace and encouragement and a, an assurance of what they're doing, what you have called them to do? Can we prepare their hearts for the tragedy and the devastation that they're going to see? That they can find comfort in who you are and that you have called them to do just this. God, this morning as we head into the last week of a series of some things that have been hard to talk about, God, we pray, we continue to pray you'll open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts to see you, to hear exactly what you want us to hear. We'll be open to your nudges when you're asking us to take that next step, even if it's scary. We love you and we praise you. We thank you for who you are. We ask these things in your name and everyone said, amen. You may be seated. So this may not be uh, that shocking to you if you know me very well, but uh, I, I am an only child. Uh, that's not the laugh at. I'm, I'm, so, uh, but my mom is a twin sister and when I was growing up in Oklahoma, we lived, uh, the block that we lived on, on the complete opposite side of the block was my mom's twin, my aunt. And she had two boys. One was a year younger than me, and one was two years younger than me. And we were together all the time. We went everywhere together. We were more like brothers than, than cousins. And th that was it. We were always together. Now, what I will tell you is we lived in a little bit of a child's paradise that that block that separated us on one end of that block was a vacant lot that was the football field the baseball field the soccer field the whatever field we needed it to be and on the other end 
was a neighbor who had a concrete driveway and he installed uh, basketball hoops for us to play. And it was just great. And this neighborhood was full of young boys and we were together all the time. But this Saturday morning, it was just the three of us. And we're playing basketball at this court, a driveway, and we're having a good time. Now, one of the things is the younger brother could be difficult. He had a mouth and he just would pick and prod and push his older brother. And I didn't have siblings. These two were probably as close to siblings as I would have. But as that younger brother just continued to pick and push and just, I, with wisdom, as a nine or 10 year old, wisdom, said, You need to punch him in the nose. Uh, because, you know, that just was logic for a nine and 10 year old. You just need to punch him in the nose and get this over with because he will not stay quiet. And he just kept on. And, and the older brother was just like, don't worry about it. Let it go. And I'm like, I, it, evidently you don't know me at all because I cannot deal with it. He just kept on and kept on. And I said a few things to the younger brother to get him to stop. He just, it, all it did was fuel the fire. And he would just kept on and he kept on. And as we're playing, it's getting not as much fun. It's starting to wane. And all of a sudden, after I have had a verbal altercation with the younger brother, I turn my back to encourage the older brother to shut the younger brother up and a basketball hits me in the back. The younger brother throws a ball at me. So again, with wisdom of any nine-year-old and with fist of fury, I turned and punched him as hard as I could in the shoulder. And simultaneously, almost as if time stood still, as I turned to hit him, I felt a fist in the back of my head. It was the older brother defending the punk baby brother. And in a moment's notice, all three of us end up on the driveway. We are rolling around. It is a scene out of the WWE. Elbows, biting, pulling hair, whatever you could do, screaming at each other. And we went at it. Now, this seemed like an hour and a half. I think it was probably a minute. But as my mom got off work that Saturday morning and she pulled up, and as she pulled up, I could hear her honking the horn and yelling at us. She made her way across the road from where we live to the street, to the driveway, and she whipped all three of us <laughs> in the driveway. I'm not sure how she did it, but there was one hand, there was fist, there was belts, I don't know. But she went crazy. And she began yelling and whipping and crying, and she couldn't believe that we would do this to each other. I learned a valuable lesson that day that has stuck with me since I was probably about nine years old. And, and here are the three things I learned. First one, my mom was much quicker than I thought. She's short, but those legs were moving that day. She got across there. I'm not even sure her toes were hitting the concrete. Second thing is never get between two brothers. They'll figure it out. So I learned that. And the third thing is family matters are really, really difficult. Family matters are really, really difficult. And I, I don't know that I fully understood it then as much as I think I understand it now. But family, are they're just hard. Families are hard. And, you know, as my old, the older brother was letting it go and letting it go and just ignoring, and I couldn't. I, I learned that there was some dynamics. I didn't live in that house. I don't know everything that was happening. I don't know anything that was happening, really. But what I've learned now is that family matters are difficult. They're hard. And here's part of the reason why is because we have expectations when it comes to family. We feel like our family should just be better. We have an expectation our family will be better. 
When we see other family members, we, we probably, we see other families in the community, in our own neighborhoods, in our own church, we start thinking, at least my family's better than that one. At least we're better than that one. So we have this, this expectation that family will be better, that I will always be loved, that I'll always be accepted, that my family will always value me. And no matter what else happens in this world, I'll always be safe. But what we know to be true is those aren't always true. That may be the expectation we create, that's the expectation we want, but we understand today you understand today, that's just not always the case. So we're gonna have a hard discussion today. And it is hard because as we made light of it in the announcement, how many have ever been hurt by family members? When we had an expectation that our family would behave a certain way and they didn't and they hurt us, Sometimes it was intentional, sometimes it was on accident. Regardless of how it happened, it happened. So how do we handle this? And if you were in the room when we kind of made that little straw poll, you realize you're not alone. You are not alone. You are not the anomaly. You are not the odd one. This is not necessarily just you and your side of the family. It's all of us. We're all that way. We all have family hurts. We all have things that are creeping up that the truth, if it comes out, you will know. And it hurts. It's painful. So I've asked a couple of friends to help me out today. They're a part of the counseling center here. And I've asked John Thomas and Amy Tharp if they would come on up. Would you guys welcome John and Amy? Yeah. They did a great job first service and just helping kind of talk about things. And, and really what we want to have happen is to create a space to where it's okay to talk about hard things at church. Where we can talk about the things that are disappointing and hurtful. And uh, it's not all about it being perfect when we walk in. So just maybe if you just take a moment, Amy, you can begin. Just, just tell us a few things about yourself and... So good morning. My name is Amy Tharp. Yeah. Got to use this thing, right? <laughs> Got to use this. My name is Amy Tharp. I am one of four of the therapists in the counseling center, and uh, I want to tell you of the other two. John's going to introduce himself. Uh, Stacy Newton is with us, and then a gal named Janet Cravens. Um, our primary goal in the Hope Center, the counseling center, is that we can partner along people who feel some sort of struggle that they need support or assistance with, and that we can use a Christian perspective to help them kind of understand the hurts and wounds that are happening in their life. Yeah. And I'm John Thomas, um, and uh, been counseling for decades, okay? Uh, but pleased to be here, and I love the idea of bringing my counseling experience and my training alongside biblical principles. And that's one of the things I strive to do. Yeah, so when we, we began this series a few weeks ago, one of the things we talked about was the beauty of scripture. That in, in God's infinite wisdom, he didn't sugarcoat it. In scripture, we see, we obviously see the good sides of the men and women that are, are recorded in the New and Old Testament. And it, it talks about all of the good things. They are just recorded for all the things that are happening in their life, and, and we see it, but we also see the bad. We see the sin. We see the mistakes. We see the ugly that we would probably not want recorded for all the world to see, and, but we see it in Scripture. And we started talking about the story of David, and there's so much written about David. There's so much information about David and, and his, from shepherd to king and to the, his legacy but we also understand that his family life was really kind of a mess. And he had all of these children and all these wives and concubines. And, and so there is a situation that takes place that we're going to really focus on in Samuel chapter 13. And, and when we see this, it is a, a brother and another brother and a sister. And this horrific, 
terrible act that takes place. So in, in 2 Samuel 13, verse 1, it says this. In the course of time, Amnon, son of David, fell in love with Tamar, the beautiful sister of Absalom, son of David. Amnon became so obsessed with his sister Tamar that he made himself ill. And she was a virgin, and it seemed impossible for him to do anything to her. So David had all of these wives. There are, there are eight of them named in Scripture. Many writers believe there are much more than that. And he also had multiple concubines. That there are over 20 children listed in Scripture. And with so many different family members and trying to come around together, it would have been almost impossible, impossible to keep peace. But when we skip down further in this chapter, we're going to see where really kind of a, a, this battle, this, this sin breaks out uh, between two of sets of children from different mothers and, and how it takes place. And it's in verse 11 of 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 13. But when she took him some to eat, and so let me just pause right there for a second. The, the story is already continued. We're not reading all of it. It is the, the, the one brother, Amnon, has asked for the sister Tamar to serve him. And that's what we see when we pick up verse 11. He grabbed her and he said, come to bed with me, my sister. No, my brother, she said to him. Don't force me. Such a thing should not be done in Israel. Don't do this wicked thing. What about me? Where could I get rid of my disgrace? And what about you? you? You would be like one of the wicked fools in Israel. Please speak to the king. He will not keep me from being married to you. But he refused to listen to her. And, and since he was stronger than, than she, he raped her. Then Amnon hated her with intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he had loved her. And Amnon said to her, get up and get out. No, she said to him, sending me away would be a greater wrong than what you've already done to me. But he refuses to listen to her. So David is the father, but there's different mothers. And a relationship would not necessarily have been totally out of bounds. It would have not have been right, but it would have been culturally acceptable and could have potentially worked out. And she is begging him, do not disgrace me in this way. Now, I, I'm sure that there was already tension within the family, but this is not going to help things. And it's an obvious conflict that there is sin going on in the life of the one brother and the way he has treated his sister, what he has done, and it is absolutely wrong. It was sin. It was a conflict. And what we begin to see is what is unraveling in this story. There was an opportunity. It's not that you could press the rewind button and fix this, but there is an opportunity to bring healing. And this is what happens in 2 Samuel 13, verse 21, it says, When King David heard all this, he was furious. And Absalom never said a word to Amnon, either good or bad. He just hated Amnon because he had disgraced his sister Tamar. Now, we'll dive into that passage and kind of break that up in just a moment. But I, I want to ask John and, and Amy, and John, I'm going to ask you first, is, you know, Obviously, this is conflict in the family, and every family has conflict. Now, it may not be to this extreme. It could be worse, and it could be minor. So how do we handle conflict in the family? Well, I, I think conflict happens in, in a lot of families. I know it had happened in my family. So, uh, And how we dealt with the conflict that happened within my family uh, was very different depending on the sibling. And on, there were eight of us, so uh, rather big family. Um, some of us went and got educated and became counselors, which was part of the reason why I did. Um, mm. Some of us pulled pulled in within ourselves. Some of us became very angry and stopped talking to others. Um, you know, but but we all have ways of dealing with conflict. Um, David's lack of action, uh, Am, uh, Amnon's abusive behavior, Absalom's, you know, took and internalized his anger for it for two or three years, okay, and then eventually he killed his brother. So, um, but, but our attitudes and beliefs uh, decide how we behave and resolve conflict. Um, we, 
you know, our conflict can create consequences, you know, uh, either good or bad, okay? Um, we all have actions and tendencies that can relate back to our childhood, our past experiences, and our trauma. Some resolved and some unresolved, okay? Um, to push down or be a loose cannon with our emotions can really create a tension within the family or within relationships, okay? Um, and unresolved trauma, okay, and emotions or pain can lead to depression, anxiety, addictions, self-hatred and shame, or a lot of other unhealthy habits or behaviors. Unresolved conflict within a relationship has the ability to affect every part of our body, okay? Uh, body, soul, and mind, okay? Uh, so dealing with it is definitely something that we want to do as soon as we can. So, Amy, so when we talk about why is unresolved conflict just so dangerous then? The word unresolved, I think, means a lot in this situation. Uh, I want to open it up to thinking about different things besides family conflict. But look at, look at debt, right? When you have a big, huge bill that's outstanding and you have to really worry about covering that, that's very stressful. Um, medical care, if you have treatment or procedures that are coming up, um, we just want answers. That's very stressful when that's unresolved. And then, of course, car repairs. You know, everything keeps happening and happening and happening. And until we get that fixed, we see that wonderful mechanic that we have uh, to help us out, it's stressful. So if we ignore a family or a relationship original conflict, it will negatively affect not only the first people involved in that conflict, but also as you tell your story, it will also start infecting others. It will spread, so to speak. Um, that can result in a lot of hurt, resentment, and division within that family or relationship. In fact, we're hurting those people that we love. If we continue to ignore the issue, feelings of depression, uh, desperation, fear, all of those things can start affecting us in very physical ways, and that's going to affect us every day that we get up out of bed. Um, stomach aches, headaches, high blood pressure, heart disease, change in sleeping or eating habits, crying episodes, even a weakened immune system. And if you really want to think about it, it can affect the longevity of your life. Wow. So in the next, the rest of this chapter, the, the middle pieces of this is, we're not going to read all of it, but just kind of paraphrase it. As we've read, Absalom just hated. So on the outside, he's playing it cool, but on the inside, he's boiling over what Amnon's done to his sister Tamar. And it says in, in verses 23 through 33, it just basically says that he waits two years. He festers in this hostility, this anger. He waits two years, and he acts like he's throwing this gathering, a, a party for all of his brothers to come to and to spend time and to hang out. And while they are in the midst of this celebration, he orders his guys to murder, to kill Amnon. And they do. And it's, it's because of what he's done. It's, he, he realizes that by murdering his brother, he's got guilt. He now has to deal with this. And he flees. He takes off. And we've read in this passage that it said David was furious. And that's it, period. He was angry about it. He was uncomfortable with it. But he did nothing to solve it. He didn't do anything. He could have acted swiftly and, and dealt with his disgraceful son Amnon, but he chose not to. He chose to do nothing. Now, this wasn't about showing grace. This wasn't an act of, of a king or a father saying, you know, we just need to let this go. It was David not dealing with the problem. It was not confronting the sin. It was not meeting the conflict head on. And so it creates more problems. So we see in, in 2 Samuel 13, verse 38, it says, after Absalom fled and went to Geshur, he, he stayed there three years. And King David longed to be with Absalom, for he was consoled concerning Amnon's death. Absalom fled to Geshur. And, and so I, I started looking that up. Why did he go to Geshur, and why was it mentioned? I mean, could have just said he just took off. Well, the first thing is Geshur was an independent kingdom. It didn't fall, even though it was very close. It was in part of it. It was not really under David's authority. 
So it was an independent nation. It stood, and the king of Geshur was Absalom's grandfather. The king of Geshur had offered his daughter to King David as, as kind of a treaty between the nations to, to broker peace, which, again, in the culture and timeline of our world, that was, that was a totally acceptable move to do something like that. But this, this daughter that is offered to David, she had two children that we know of. Could have been more, but the two we know of, Absalom and Tamar. So he went to his grandfather's palace and told the story of what has happened. And he is, he's reeling from the guilt of the murder, the thinking, because anytime we respond in revenge, there is a moment you feel good about your decision and then a lifetime of regret. And he has to deal with this now. And maybe he was afraid David would kill him or because he's got a retribution over taking a son. But again, David did nothing. In fact, it says he longed to be with his son, Absalom. But that's where it ends. And I mean, based on what we know in scripture, based on what we know in history, when a king wants to do something, they do it. Very few people tell them no. But the king got mad, and the king longed for his son, and he didn't do anything. He sit. Basically, what takes place is the two years of hostility that brews, and then a son that flees for his life and, and, and festers more sin. He spends another three years and basically comes up with this plan to lead a rebellion to overthrow David as king. And he begins to overtake him. David has to flee the city. And a war will break out between these two nations. Basically a civil war that will cost over 20,000 people their lives. You can read in 2 Samuel 13 and 14. You will see the story. So 20,000 people in this civil war have, have lost their lives. A brother has raped a sister. A brother has killed a brother. And then fled, took off, all because sin was not confronted. Conflict was unresolved. So I, I, John and, and Amy, and you, I'm not sure who's going to answer this one first, so you guys can do thumb wars or whatever, but how do we handle when family doesn't act like family should and we get hurt? Well, first of all, I think Sean said you have to confront it. Be, but you have to confront the conflict in a safe environment, okay? Not all environments are safe. Uh, and I totally agree with Sean. Forgiveness feels good, you know, in the beginning. It's like, oh, I got that sucker. So, um, but forgiveness is, is, forgiveness is more satisfying in the long run than revenge. Uh, don't trade in your peace your maturity, uh, your, your spiritual growth, or your integrity uh, just to add suffering to another person's life. Um, we have to do something that, that, that we all do, okay? Uh, some of us better than others. We have to set boundaries. Uh, and I'm going to let Amy talk a little bit about that. So when I was thinking about how to talk about how do we get past this hurt that we're talking about? I thought, well, we just forgive them, right? Duh. Don't we wish it was that easy? Just say, I forgive you. It's so not that easy. Uh, I'm going to read a quote that I think is um, really meaningful. I don't know who said it or I'd give them credit, but it's, be careful the behavior you tolerate from others. You're teaching them how to treat you. So we have to remember, um, you know, conflict kind of goes two ways, right? Learning to forgive can be incredibly healing, but never easy. It's pretty obvious kind of what forgiveness is. We probably all know what that is, but we don't know, and what we're going to talk about today is what it is not. It is not forgetting. It might seem easier to pretend that nothing happened, go about your business, uh, but then that avoidance that we talked about is so unhealthy, that's what happens. So when you forgive, you're not saying that I'll ignore that it happened and pretend everything's okay, but you are saying you hurt me and that was wrong, 
but I'm choosing not to take revenge or to punish you on that. In some situations, we might need to limit the time that we spend with that person, make sure it's a safe environment, like John said, or we might uh, kind of need to be aware of, are, do I need other people in there? Do I need to be in a public place where I can make sure nothing bad's gonna happen? Most importantly, that setting boundaries issue, um, you have to decide what behavior you will not tolerate being around. So you might end up having to say something like, I will not stay if you yell at me or if you insult me. I will need to leave the room. You may feel like it's your family that needs help, but it may be helpful for you to find help and counseling as well. Um, this helps you explore your wounds, right? You, you might know that you're feeling badly, but you don't know what's all involved with that. So talking to a Christian counselor would be great and finding some healing um, start on that journey. It's not one session and done. It's a journey, isn't it? I'm trying to find that healing and that health. Good. You know, and I think, you know, the way I view it, okay, is picture uh, uh, your yard, okay, and picture your backyard with a, with a fence in it, okay? Um, and our, our, our backyard or our fence, that's our space, okay? We get to choose who we're going to let inside that backyard, okay? Are they safe? You know, uh, am I safe? Who am I going to allow to be part of, of seeing the real me, okay? Uh, so we've got a backyard, okay? Um, and you're responsible, okay? You're the gatekeeper for your own personal backyard, who are you going to allow in that gate and in that backyard under what circumstances? So you may have to say, I'm only going to meet with you, okay, if other families or members are here. Or I'm only going to meet with you uh, with, with a counselor or one of the pastoral staff, okay? Or sometimes it's, I'm not going to meet with you at all, um, you know, because, because reconcil forgiveness does not necessarily mean reconciliation all the time. A lot of time it does, okay? Um, but who do you allow into, back, into your backyard, and are they people of integrity who will respect you and your boundaries, or are they boundary bullies? So... We, we wanted it to be a time where we could kind of have this open dialogue that you are not alone. You're not alone. That families, there's hurts, there's pain, there's sin, there's mistakes, and you're not alone. That I, I wonder sometimes if when we walk in on a Sunday and we gather, and maybe you're watching with us online, and you may begin to kind of think that, you know, we say, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm great. And we say it, but beyond the smile, behind the smile, there's a lot more going on. There's a lot more pain. There's a lot more hurts. There's things we've hidden. There's things that we don't want to talk about. There's things we don't want to bring up. But this has kind of got to become a safe place to where we can say, there is some hurts. There are some pains. There's some things that have happened to me that I wish, I, I, I can't go back and press the rewind button. I can't fix it. But how do I move forward? How do I continue on? How do I keep taking the next step in my spiritual life? That I, I, I go from just being hopeful or a walker or a runner to a sore. That I move the needle in my spiritual life because this has become a, block, a stumbling block for me. This has become a gate that I, I, I can't seem to open and I can't seem to close. And I gotta do this, but you are not alone. You are not alone. Two things, everybody in the room is dealing with something more than likely that deals with family. Every one of us. There's something in our family that probably comes up. And the second thing is, that means there's, there's all of us are in this same boat together, but the other one is, there's a heavenly father that is walking along beside you. And we were going to take a few moments 
and, and to sing this song and to pray together. Uh, but one of the lines in this song is that you walk with me in the darkest of nights. In the darkest of nights. In those moments when the, the bomb of our world has gone off. He's there. We're not alone. So I'm going to invite you to stand with me. As we just take the next few moments, as we are going to sing together, but maybe today you need a place to just pause, to just maybe to pray. And we talk about there's nothing magical about the wooden furniture up here, these altars. They are just great places to pray. If you're online, please jump in a private chat room with one of our pastors or volunteers. But if there is something going on and you, you just need somebody to come alongside you, you don't have to tell them the story. You don't have to offer any information. But I, there are friends in the room today that would love to pray for you. They'd love to pray for you. Just to let you know you are not alone that you're not alone. So as we get ready to sing, as I pray, if you would like to come and kneel, come and sit in one of the front rows or just sit on the altar, uh, we've got folks that'll be praying with you and for you right now. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day, this time we have to gather as your people, that we are not alone. That not only is everybody going through something, has had to endure disappointment, heartache, sin, but also you are with us. And this song just describes it so well that you walk with us in the darkest of moments and that you are good. That even in the bad, even in the misery, even in the pain, you are good. Father, we, we cannot understand fully all of the things. We don't, it just may not make sense. But Father, what we pray for is a clarity of your divine healing and touch in our lives to bring restoration to relationships, to bring healing to the emotional wounds and the pain that has been caused and that we can be whole that more and more we reflect who you are in our lives. That we unwind this garbage, this stuff, and address the pain. So Father, I pray right now that you be with us in these moments, that you give our people nudges that need hope, the need to know they're not alone, that need healing, and need to know you are there. And we ask these things in your most precious and holy name. And everybody said,
So I, I am totally aware when you came in, you hopefully you received a second handout besides a bulletin. It just talks about the counseling center. Now, you may have been sitting there or maybe you're with us online and you thought, there is no way on this side of heaven I'm walking to the front of that room and let everybody know that something horrible or horrific has happened in my life. I get that. I do. Please, don't sit on it. Don't keep shoving it down and trying to avoid it and pretending it will get better. Reach out to somebody. There are four folks that will love you silly and will help you. There's others here that we can refer you to, but please come and talk to somebody. Come and talk to somebody. At least let them validate you. Let them validate your feelings and hear you and what's happening. So I encourage you, make sure you reach out to them and connect with one of them. You can always holler at one of us on staff. We would love to talk to you, and then we'll probably refer you to them. So just know that's the process. So we want you, we want you to get hope and healing. You are not alone, right? You're not alone. You're not alone. We are so glad that you worshiped with us today. We celebrate. Remember, if you uh, are a guest or visitor, stop by Guest Central. We have a gift for you. Also, that we are also getting ready to kick off another uh, premarital class. So if you're thinking about getting married and you want to be a part of this, make sure you get signed up. You can get more information at the Information Center. Thanks for worshiping with us. We can't wait to see you again soon.